Welcome back. You're still watching Debrek on this 21st day of uh, May 2024. And uh, Chairman, I mean, sorry, not Chairman, but uh, Moshmua uh, Kiplating, you were just about to uh, make your remarks based on some of the issues that have been highlighted by uh, Chairman Mbadi here on the offensive clauses that he cites. Um, what did you want to say? Okay, thank you so much. First of all, uh, since you've given me an opportunity to make a response to it for also, let me start on the economic situation of the country and appreciate the fact that the interventions made by executive in the sector of agriculture is mm -hmm. bearing results. You know, agriculture is the core uh, support of our economic system. If you look at the input, uh, again, as I was seeing the trade of, um, where in the paper, the trade of balance. Uh, deficit as it has been experienced before is now improving. We've grown, we've reduced from over 250 to 134. One of this is because of the import substitutes, which it has taken a lot of uh, tax expenditure. So it looks like uh, whatever interventions we are doing and focusing on production, in the long run, we're able to manage, first of all, our stability of our country, ensuring that we have food that is affordable and that we can place on the table. So that is a good uh, report, that is a good indicator that we are going in the right direction. The second sector now that we need to put our energies is the manufacturing sector, now that we have a driver factor from production. Uh, on these other issues uh, raised by my colleague, as I started early, uh, nothing to worry. You know, sometimes when you allow uh, a colleague like uh, John Barty, of course, having a different view, uh, you might discourage Kenyans. It looks like uh, this one has been concluded. As I've said, we still have a moment of engaging and also inquiring from Kenyans. At the same level, you mm -hmm. are trying to, or you are seeking for the side of expenditure to be increased to accommodate. Look at the JSS, what they are saying. Look at the doctors, what they are asking. Look at the devolution, what they are asking. All this sum up together, it increases the expenditure. Mm -hmm. So we also, the same way we must debate on the side of financing. So at this one, it enables Kenyans build up a resilience of engaging and being involved in their own management of the resources and uh, on their budget of the country. Um, the issues to do with uh, advanced tax or uh, withholding tax, I think this is a good move. Uh, this is where Kenyans, we are going the right direction. That look at this, we are saying from the same tax which are paid by somebody else, you've got an opportunity to get employment to do supplies. What we are saying, are we able to know? Maxims of tax. I, I think the maxims of tax. Let, let's first of all explain what uh, you're talking about because there's that proposal uh, to impose taxation on income received from the supply of goods to a public entity. For instance, if you're to uh, sell uh, printing papers yes. uh, to Parliament, yes, and Parliament makes a payment to you, yes, then three percent to be charged as withholding tax for that supply. You're saying what is the justification? The justification is the same. Look at this. Any business, of course, you do business with an expectation of making gains or profits. That is a fact. What you are saying, this is where taxpayers' money has been used to create an employment to you. Unlike traditionally, where KRA, the agency on collection, has been forced to go after, that is, audits of these agencies every now and then. And you realize during audits there are penalties, you know, all this. Because in the long run, as much as business try to find a smart way of uh, avoiding taxes, some of the expenses by law <coughs> are not uh, exempted. But they have been filing their returns annually, indicating that they file the losses. But when post audits comes in, which is a very expensive exercise, again, the outcome of it has been punitive to the taxpayers. So what are they saying? The 3% of what we are paying you, we take it at source, finance our budget, or finance the expenditure side. After you filing your returns, probably your financial year uh, lays at the point where you are filing your returns now in the 30th June. If there is any expenditure to hit, and if there is any loss that you made, the law allows you to carry the tax credit to the subsequent financial year, which is a practice, and uh, my colleague accountant understands that when you're preparing taxes. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is the tax regime that the government is trying to propose is to reduce the cost of collecting by ensuring at source 3% is taken and you run the institution. And it's not, this, but, is, but this, is, this is, is not is unique. Is it not because possible? On the service sector, my, my sister will tell you as a lawyer, whenever she offers services, 5% of what is due to her is always taken at source. So it's a new thing. It's not a new thing, only that the bracket has been expanded now to the so, supplies so, of other So people. I don't know, what's your response, Irene, to that proposal? Because I'm just wondering, what if, for, for sure, for sure, that I supply the printing papers, but because of the expenditure within my organization, I'm actually making losses. I, I see legal hiccups. If we go back to the minimum tax that was uh, in court, the issue is you cannot assume 
someone will make an income. Though, as Moshimi was saying, in the ordinary sense of doing business, you assume when you are bidding for work, you have already factored in your profit. That is what we assume. But as you're rightfully saying, they might not be making a profit. So that is an assumption, and I see a, a legal bottleneck there. I think rather than uh, uh, KRA trying to minimize the administrative bottleneck, similar the way they have been going after taxpayers, they should find a way of collecting that money, but not prior and with an assumption. So I see a balancing of two, two interests. Mm. So how do you ensure? Because again, there's been quite a lot of tax avoidance and evasion in this country, which is a thing we need to address. So whether that is the right route, I think not. So for me, uh, I see first a legal bottleneck. I don't think it's a just way to do it, but I agree that tax avoidance and evasion is a key thing that we must find a way of uh, going around. Oh, all right, D Dr. Kiro, how do you respond to that particular proposal, but also are there areas that for you, you think really stand out to uh, go against uh, the interest of Kenyans? Yes, I would rather look at the areas that I strongly feel like they go against the interest of Kenyans, for example. I'm a development economist, and one important thing about uh, domestic mobilization of <coughs> revenue, revenue must go into build into economic growth, building sustainable livelihoods, ensuring that there's resilience in the people's, uh, in how people are impacted by all mm -hmm. these things. If you look at the insurance tax, the 2.5% insurance, it's one task I've tried to think about. And you, I you think- You mean on the motor vehicles? Yeah, 2.5%, okay. the value of the motor vehicles, to start with that one. Mm -hmm. It's something I've tried to think about, and I am thinking that it's going to be the, the compliance burden is going to be so high, and the administrative cost, 2.5%, if you insure your car comprehensively at 3%, you are almost doubling your insurance policy premiums. Mm. It's almost double, and they are not cheap as they stand. Now, my rational being will say that I'll do third party. And now this is where the problem begins. Because I'm like, other than double my insurance premium, I don't have, it's too costly, I'll just do third party and just comply with the law that I should not drive without insurance. What does that mean to the insurance company? If I'm doing third party, they, they will not be insuring my car. So they, they, have no, they have no business with following my car. Mm -hmm. Yet the government wants that car valued. Who is going to bear that cost? And that's the first handle. The second handle is, even if, even if the insurance company, pro, uh, even if I say, okay, I'm a good citizen, I love it valued, it means that then the, insur the, the insurer <coughs> is supposed to be handling finance. You see, third party insurance, if you look at the comprehensive cover, is, is a very small proportion mm -hmm. to a comprehensive cover. It means that now the insurer will have to invest resources to collect money for government and money which is way above mm -hmm. their own income. Is that even legal? Lawyers are here. Is it even implementable? I mean, they are asking for too much for people to comply for that. Turn back to the matatus. Who uses matatus? The poor people and people who are vulnerable, if I run out of money in the middle of the, of the month, I jump into a matatu. <coughs> it's, but millions of poor people who have no other means of transportation use matatus. And how have matatus managed to serve this population of poor people over the years? By keeping the cost low. And matatus have gone out of their way to assume the risk, and they always do third party insurance. Why? Because it's costly to do comprehensive cover and they'd like to continue serving poor people. Now here is your government telling them, you must afford what you cannot afford and give it to me. From a social economic perspective, how does that sound? Is it even reasonable? Does the government really care for the people? Is a Matatu Owners Association more mindful about the Kenyans and the government? Who is taking care of us, is it? Mm. So at the end of the day, those are things which are stand out. The other thing for me is the um, excise duty on financial transaction and the whole business of, of the 16%. Right. I know it's coming from the idea that financial inclusion is growing. And, also, and I went back to the numbers last evening. 
and financial inclusion stood at 84% with a gender gap of 6%, meaning that women are less likely to be, to, to be financially excluded. And I went further down. So the, out of the 84% counted as financially included, 42% of them only have a mobile phone, a mobile money account, 42%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? These people have no chance of earning any, in, any interest from their savings. They have no insurance. They have no pensions. Why would government want to, want to hit those people? That's what I'm talking about, resilience. Mm -hmm. There is, other than help these people to be more resilient and strengthen the financial inclusion, because if you look at what is financial inclusion, it's, just, it's, it's not just about having a mobile money account alone or a bank account alone. It should include things like insurance, things like pension, and things like savings, and other financial services that contribute to your well-being and resilience. Yet the government is tearing down at all that. There's many more, but I'm sure okay. Joseph wants to put in a word. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, you've taken us back to the motor vehicle tax, and um, I'll come to it shortly. But um, on that proposal that Mushimu um, here, Ike Plating, was talking about, uh, about <coughs> withholding tax for the supplies made to public institutions, but you had something to say. Mm -hmm. But as you say that, I have found the section you're referring to about the minimum top-up tax that is talking about, and I'll read it in what is indicated there. Um, notwithstanding any other provision of this act, a tax known as minimum top-up tax shall be payable by a covered person where the combined effective rate in respect of that person for a year of income is less than 15%. Um, then says the combined effective rate for a covered person shall be the sum of all the adjusted covered taxes divided by the sum of all net income or loss for the year of income multiplied by 100. What is that? And then it goes on. Uh, then it goes on to the amount of tax. More, the amount of tax payable shall be the difference between 15% of the net income or loss <coughs> for the year of income of a covered person and the combined effective tax rate for the year of income multiplied by the excess profit of the covered person. Yeah, that, okay. that, that is exactly what I was talking about. You know, when you want one of the principles of taxation mm -hmm. is simplicity. It has to be simply, uh, simple and easy to compute. So the moment you come up with those uh, mathematical permutations where now you are going to <coughs> all the combined effective tax rates of, uh, that you will be picking all the taxes that an individual pays and then summing them up to determine whether they are more than 15% of the profit, not 15% of, of the profit, and then now you subtract 15% minus the co collective mm. uh, tax, combined tax, and then you put it over the profit and you multiply by 100, then now you move. You see, it is only mathematicians who can go <laughs> with me. Now, that is why I'm saying that I, I don't know who's thinking through but Do you think this, it's job creation uh, for, for a CPA like you? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, but, but, but there's something, uh, uh, some that you said uh, that yeah. we were talking about on withholding tax. Yeah. And, and, and my uh, professional junior here uh, was trying to really support it uh, uh, with all his might. Personally, I'm not uh, supporter of withholding tax for obvious reason that withholding tax is just a convenience for the government and the uh, tax collector. It is based on nothing. You cannot just tell me that if I have supplied uh, these newspapers that I take the gross, uh, rev uh, the gross income that I get mm. and you take 3% of it. Yet, for example, this newspaper, I'm sure the person who sells this newspaper uh, at 60 shillings makes maybe only two shillings. That is actually his gross income mm -hmm. because the rest he pays back to uh, the, the, the person who supplied the newspaper, uh, the, the media house. Mm -hmm. The 2% is actually gross because he has not taken uh, out of that two, two shillings the transport, uh, the, the lunch that he takes and all the other expenses. So to me, you are telling Kenyans to be paying in advance tax that there has not even been computed. And we know the history of this country with the tax, re tax refunds. It is not something to be happy about. So what we are doing is subjecting more Kenyans, most of whom actually are strugglers, mm. these are people we call hustlers, to pay 
upfront an amount that they have not even earned. Uh, it is to me, no, that it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, let us target profit. This if tax evasion thing, it is aided. It is supported by our corrupt system. Why don't we just fix that system? Why don't we embark on tax administration mm -hmm. and make sure that tax administration is streamlined? And when we come with um, more of these proposals, like the one you've just read, right. you are creating more room for corruption. Because as he puts it, uh, now the CPAs are the ones who will be uh, doing the calculations and the math. And you see, we can now sit down and agree that this is what you're going to pay, and out of it, this is what I collect. Mm. That is not the direction that this country uh, should be taking. Right. Um, I, really, I don't know if you have uh, views to us that, but I would also want us to spend some time to focus on the proposal. Um, there is eco levy being proposed. There shall be paid a levy to be known as the eco levy yes. on the goods specified in the fourth schedule manufactured in Kenya or imported into Kenya. The eco levy shall be paid to the commissioner at the rate specified <coughs> schedule. Um, again, a complicated um, um, calculation there. Just want to get to uh, some more details about it. So yes, so the eco levy will be payable on specific goods such as machinery, telephone sets, broadcasting apparatus, rubber tires, diapers, batteries or dry cells, and plastic packaging material to ensure that the manufacturers and importers of the goods pay for their negative and env environmental impact. Um, where is this uh, taking us? But on the face of it, what is your reaction and what should Parliament do to eco levy? Hmm. Thanks, Sam. But uh, well, allow me to just give a rejoinder to some of the comments that came, particularly on the minimum tax. Yeah. I think you should take us through the minimum tax to see the threshold they've put. Mm -hmm. So the minimum tax does not anticipate your ordinary business person. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and when uh, Moshimiwa has mentioned that uh, corruption is an aspect we need to be aware of, I'd like to inform us that uh, a lot of tax that we lose is as a result of commercial transactions and planning, aggressive tax planning by corporates, particularly multinationals. So uh, corruption is a part of it, but a huge part of it is commercial transactions that Africa and not just Kenya lose. So that it's an area that is worth the effort and worth those formulas. When you're looking at your multinationals, it's not your ordinary person. And I think that is why we also have the large taxpayers department at the Kenya Revenue Authority. That mm -hmm. should be resourced with people that we pay, should be able to design those formulas because you're up against uh, auditors from other countries, accountants from other countries that want to avoid and give the list. Mm -hmm. And if we do so, not... So let, let me take you through the sh threshold. Covered person means a resident person or a person with a permanent establishment in Kenya who is a member of a multinational group and the group has a consolidated annual turnover of 750 million euros or more in the consolidated financial statements of the ultimate parent entity in at least two of the four years of income immediately preceding the tested year of income. So there's a threshold that already locks out the smaller people. So I don't see it as a threat to the smaller uh, taxpayers. And this is discourse that has been at the African region, following mm -hmm. up closely from the Thabo Mbeki report that shows that Africa loses significant amount of uh, taxes, not from corruption. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, corruption is what we normally say, but corruption is dwarfed by aggressive tax planning and commercial transactions. That is why when the minimum tax was in court last year, it has still found its way mm. in the 2024 because uh, our country is aware on how much we are losing. So I would say that, that th there is uh, room for probably just looking at the formula, but it's something we need to be alive to. Uh, Sam and uh, colleagues, if we don't do that, then it means the government comes for the hustlers and the smaller ones. So if we are already complaining around tax on bread, then it will get worse if you leave these ones out. And my contribution really uh, on the finance bill is that I think we are looking at the bread, the motor vehicle, and, and with all this, we are losing, we, we might throw out very good provisions uh, that need to be addressed. So one for me, uh, 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 Moshimi Waruto, when you look at that act, is to look at the issues around illicit financial flows. Look at uh, uh, the fact that we are continuing to give tax breaks to, to multinationals, to uh, 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 entities in the special economic zone, and then you're hurting the smaller taxpayers. Capital gain tax has been proposed to move from 15 to 5% 
for a country, for an entity investing in Kenya, and it's under the guise of attracting investment. But we have been giving this, and we still unemployment is still high. So with this attracting and ceding our taxing rights, saying we will get employment, but unemployment is still uh, uh, high. Why not take the money from some of these multinationals and investors and invest, and, and, and invest in uh, human, right, <coughs> human development indicators, which from yesterday's report were a bit low? So that, for me, is a conversation that I, I would like the, the Finance Committee to look at it, critically look at provisions targeting multinational, special economic zones. How much are we losing out? Balance that. Of course, I wouldn't sit here and say we don't need to attract investors. We do need, but we, there's a delicate balancing act between the two. So that is an area that I think we are chasing mm -hmm. other issues, but we don't need to lose uh, uh, sight of that. So just, just to balance that. Um, and when you mentioned the, the, the eco levy, I think that's also an area that seems new when introduced, but we need to be alive to climate change and issues around the environment. When we look at the recent floods, if you look at the floods within uh, a city, I also sit on the board of Nairobi uh, Revenue Authority. When you look at how much, forget about the many challenges we have in Nairobi County, but how much are we using on dispose, uh, uh, disposing our plastics and issues around that? It's a huge amount that would then be used in, in, in provision of essential medicines. So there is something we need to balance. Some sectors will eventually have to grow. Mm -hmm. and eventually ta taxation might be a tool to make us think creatively of moving towards uh, 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 environmental friendly uh, 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 substances. When you look at uh, the, the, <coughs> what we used to call it, the polythene, we thought it was impossible to live without it, but the industries evolved. It was a setback, of course, within the first year, but if we don't do that as a country, we'll have to ask ourselves, do we want to use our money? Look at budgets. And I think, uh, Sam, I would want to belabor this point, yep. that the parliamentary committees and even the finance and planning should be able to ask counties and even national, how much do you use on garbage collection? Quantify that and tell us, would we want to uh, say protect manufacturers? It's important, but how much money are we using in that area? I honestly think uh, Eco Levy has a space. Probably we should stagger how we, intro we introduce it, look at the percentages and remove the aspects of double taxation, listening in to people in the sector. They already mentioned there's a levy they pay to be able to cater for the environment. Mm. So if we bring the eco levy, then we then need to abolish the other one. But the space of the eco levy must be- So, so when you say that, um, again, it's to make sure that <coughs> organizations pay for the negative effects of their products. Is there ring fencing of that levy itself so that it <coughs> it's going to, issues of responding or taking action to protect the environment, to protect the people, or it's just financing a, a regular expenditure yeah. within the budget? Some, I think that's the problem and that's now where not to uh, fight the eco levy, but to ask what are the institutional frameworks and institutional integrity that we are putting in place. So in our submissions, one is that money should be ring first. So you cannot collect money in the guise of environment and use it to pay allowances and per diems to state and public officers. That's a no. So we have to ring fence. That is one. <coughs> when you look at that, Sam, I would also look at it uh, uh, with the tobacco products. Look at the taxation of tobacco uh, products, which we have said is a sin product. So we are happy now. As an advocate around that space, we've been advocating in Moshimi Waruto. Last time, there was no, no mention. When we appeared before your committee, there was no mention of taxation around tobacco and uh, new generation products, velos and the like. And you look at the effect of that on NCD and health budget. So you cannot speak as a country and say, we are paying social health insurance, and then you give a break to a product that contributes to the health burdens. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but then our question now is that tax has been there. We have a solatium fund for tobacco. Mm. We are happy at least with that. There's a fund, so kind of ring fencing that. Mm. So equally for the eco levy, that should be the discussion. Okay. But there's also need some to remove some products from the eco levy or bring distinction. My concern is the diapers. So diapers has been seen as, uh, it, it contributes a lot to how the environment looks, but we need to have a conversation around gender norms and how do women access workplaces when we put a prohibitive uh, uh, levy on that. And also we need to distinguish adult diapers. Adult diapers are used mainly by special needs and a lot of children's home and parents that have special needs. So if we go the way of adult with the diapers, we need to bring distinction between the marginalized groups so that it enables the women and families that have uh, sick 
okay. uh, Kenyans to still be able to engage in economic activities. So it's a mixed, I think, product by product, and then ring fencing, as you're saying, and probably reduce the levies, but not abolish. I think it's a, a good introduction when you're looking at uh, waste management. Dr. Joy Kiru, how do you balance between protecting the environment, <clears throat> but also the livelihoods of people and how they're able to afford the cost of living? Actually, <clears throat> I was listening to our talk and uh, I'm glad you came out la about the issue of looking at specific things in that eco levy, like the issue of diapers, you've already spoken, do mm -hmm. it so well. I'm also concerned about other things. The old issue about saying that uh, we are taxing to create incentive to go into green, into green, uh, into green products, that is products which are, which are so for the safer for the environment. The mm. question is, which are those? What's the alternative to an acid battery cell, for example, today? And millions of Kenyans, almost all of us, use acid battery, lead battery cells in our, um, in our cars, in our different applications, except for the laptops and the smartphones, they use the lithium cell. But what is alternative to running these cars? So if you put uh, all these taxes on this without telling us this is what, without giving an incentive of where you want us to go, you tax diapers. What, where are the green diapers, that is diapers which are safe for the environment? And do you want us to be without them? How do we work? How do we take care of the elderly? How do we take care of children? How do we move around transportation and things like that? I think my problem with this eco tax is that it is showing you what not, what not to, to do without mm -hmm. telling you what to do. That's really my biggest problem with that because it's like saying, just like the saying that if you can't, if don't eat bread, if, if, if you can't eat bread, eat, eat cake. It's the same argument. If you can't afford bread, how will you ever afford cake? Mm. So if this acid battery is a problem, it is all we know, it is all we have. What do you want us to do? Are you going to kill all sectors just because of these fancy names of eco taxes and things like that? So give the incentives on, on where you want us to go. That's my main concern. Okay, and I'm looking at, uh, for instance, the product you mentioned, diapers. Uh, they are being taxed 150 shillings per kilogram of diaper. I don't know how many diapers constitute one kg, uh, so that it would help us understand how to be the effective mm -hmm. <laughs> increment in um, a diaper a piece. Um, but what about Mbadi, what, what's your take on um, the eco levy itself, but what changes should do, should be proposed? First of all, <clears throat> we need. I agree that we need to do something about the environment. It's a global discussion, and uh, look at uh, the current. Uh, whatever is happening currently is because of the way we have mismanaged our environment over the years, mm. um, largely contributed by uh, the, the, the superpowers and uh, this developed the developed world, but. Look at the items listed in the fourth schedule. Mm. Um, most of them are electrical items. I really don't understand how that is targeted as uh, creating uh, environmental problems. Because uh, the way I understand electricity and electricals, uh, they are lesser uh, pollution, uh, polluting our environment. There are mm. others, uh, the other items. but. To me, if we have to have this levy, right. there are things we must do. We must be clear on the items to be taxed. And then two, mm -hmm. what she said, where is this money going? Because if we are going to put it uh, together or lump it together with the other revenue and use it as it will, then there would be no need of uh, that taxation. Mm -hmm. It is adding, it's creating a burden and is not offering any solution. So. That, to me, would be the amendments that we need to make is, number one, to be clear on the items to be put in that schedule, to be taxed, uh, or to be levied echo, or to be, put, uh, to be subjected to echo levy, fa levy. And then, two, we have to decide that that money will, just like railway development levy and uh, road maintenance levy, mm -hmm. we put it to echo. <coughs> Um, management. We make it money that is definitely going to manage our environment. Mm. That would require an institution. Pardon? That would require an institution. 
an institution. So to implement the fund, the, the eco levy itself? No, I don't think so. We have enough institutions in the country if we just uh, streamline them. We have, we have even a uh, state department in charge of environment. Uh, what are they doing? You know, Honorable if, Buddy, when yeah. affordable housing levy was introduced, there were different institutions that were established. Yeah but, uh, yeah, but you see, like we have the railway development levy, uh, the road maintenance levy, ETC. Okay, I know the road maintenance levy, there is the Kenya Roads, Kenya Board. Roads Board. Yeah. But we don't have to create institutions every time. Don't we have institutions now, like we have NEMA? We have, we have many institutions. We just need to uh, put systems that work okay. within those institutions. Now, much more keep letting you to say something. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, uh, I want to agree with my sister over there. These issues of uh, uh, base erosion mm -hmm. and profit shifting has been a great problem to developing countries and growing economies, where we give uh, a basis, a space for multinationals to come and utilize the cheap labor cost mm -hmm. in our country. And then by virtue of treaties, they shift their uh, profits to their low base tax area or uh, tax aversion regions mm -hmm. and in the long run kill our economy. I think this particular provision needs to be looked at critically with an objective of ensuring that we retain something for our economy. Look at this, we've given you space, <coughs> we've given you cheap labor, we've given you access to um, resources like water from our mm -hmm. country, you know, and then uh, within that closed environment of a tax-free, that is a special economic zone, whatever you produce, you're shifting your goods. When you make profits, the way you're going to file your returns is on the other hand of the of side of the tax regime. So I think this is something we need to welcome. As much as we do have different discussion, but we need to be very objective on this one. Mm -hmm. As pertains issues of eco taxes, the issues of car tax is, an, is one of the eco tax. I think I've had discussion around it, and people seem to look at it as a revenue item. If you look at it, it is in line with the treaty, with the Paris Treaty, which was signed by Kenya, which Kenya is a, is a signatory. And John Bardi agrees with me. Many motions we discuss and adopt in Parliament, treaties which have been signed by Kenya, we adopt. Uh, and in the long run now, execution has come. Where we are <coughs> as smart as or as where Kenya has committed to ensure it puts interventions to mitigate issues to do with uh, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. Germany, France, UK, and all these developed countries have been taxing what we call motor vehicle circulation tax, what is now being introduced. Maybe the issue that we need to discuss concernedly is what uh, Daktari has put, how do we administer it on the, on the aspect of uh, the attitude of Kenyans when you see that this thing might create a cost to me, you want to shift your insurance um, uh, 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 regime from uh, comprehensive probably to that part. I think those are issues of management around, but it is a welcome thing. It is not new to Kenya, but the intention, the purpose in the long run, because study shows by the year 2030, emissions in Kenya will have grown to 7%. That is a but huge- But you're already taxing the fuel. That is, but you see now, mm. the aspect here in the other countries, besides the, the fuel, what they tax, they rate the motor vehicle as per the emissions, as a factor of contribution. So this is something that we also need to impress. So, um, can I just, uh, on that, uh -huh. just rejoin on that. You see, the tax that you're levying on motor vehicles is not a circulation tax. Even if I keep my, ta my vehicle at home for the whole year except maybe one week, I drive it. I will still pay it. Mm -hmm. So it is not a circulation tax. And are you telling us that you want to discourage Kenyans from driving without offering uh, public transport? That to me would be a wrong strategy. Pro probably, as I agree with Mbati, that of course on the other sector now we need to have agencies like developed the government is thinking on providing alternative ways of public transport, like developed countries. You go to Germany, you go to Netherlands, and in fact, Netherlands is said that people from home to workplace, they use uh, bicycles, which is also fit for the environment. You, other countries use metro, that is the trains. In the long run, what we are seeking as developing countries, of course, here, I, I've been getting discussion along this, that probably this is targeting wealth tax, that as much as I'm, have a, I'm owning a vehicle, I'm being perceived to be having money, which I think is a wrong connotation. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to achieve, and look at this, this is a fact that Kenya now, we have already signed into this treaty, so we are putting into practice what we have committed, and it's not only Kenya alone, it is also other countries. So, so what does the treaty say, help us? 
Of course, uh, Kenya made a commitment on the national con uh, determination contribution to ensure that they provide mechanism of reducing the emissions. And part of the provision now is introduction of this to discourage probably in the long run, so in the because, long run, because in, 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 in the long run, yeah. is trying now to create alternative mechanism of public transport. If that is the idea then, you're saying that um, owners of vehicles will pay that motor vehicle tax, but those that are owned by county governments, national governments and other institutions, they will not be paying I'm, I'm tax. Quoting, I'm quoting devolution. You know, devolution are a huge task in terms of transport to manage, especially where transport is no, no, affected. No, I'm saying yes. the law, yes. the, the, the bill as it is, yes. it exempts vehicles owned by uh, g government institutions, for instance. Yeah. So <coughs> what carbon emissions are we dealing with? The fuel guzzlers are owned uh, on, and are run by people that are in public offices. Uh, well, uh, any regime, of course, you will agree with me, this is a start point. That's why we have all this discussion. In the long run, of course, as country Kenya, and of course, like, how did Germany start it? How did France start it? How did UK start it? It is now a regime that is well endowed with the people. Maybe, probably, how they approach theirs, they just charge based on, your, on the rate of emission annually not even on the circulations like now what you're introducing here in Kenya. So how will that be calculated? Because when you value your car, for instance, if your car is valued by the insurer at one million shillings, that value, the essence of that value is that in it, there are taxes, the import duty. Well, um, maybe that is... So what will you tax? Of course, as it is, as by the proposal of this particular finance uh, bill, is trying to look at what is a the insurer is charging this particular value, based on the value, because all accumulated together, it amounts to the value of that car. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Hear me, Honorable Kiplating. Yes. If you go to your insurer and they say that your car is valued at one million shillings, yes. Um, and this is not the market value; this is the value for the purposes of insurance. But that that value is inclusive of when you imported that car. There was the landed cost. And there was the import duty, the different kind of, I mean, a category of that, whether the excise is VAT, include in, in, in all that in totality gives you the value of that car while it's in Kenya. If you are going to tax that value, you are taxing taxes, aren't you? Uh, at the point of our discussion, what is the comfort of the value of your car? Because there's the cost of origin, CIF, mm -hmm. import taxes, all mm -hmm. this and value addition, it amounts to, that's why, what, what are you insuring? Because it's the value, that is a comfort value, what you're insuring. What yes, the, what that's what you're insuring. So it's a, it's but it, the is, same is, regime, is that what the it's government should the tax? same of your comfort of that particular car, what you are comfortably insuring, that the tax man is saying, give me a percentage of this one. Maybe the debate is, is this reasonable? And that's why the law is proposing a maximum limit and a minimum limit. I'm asking that because even when you're calculating yes. the import duty, whether it's excess tax or VAT or whatever it is, Maybe I need to ask a question. it is based on the customer. What do you insure? I'm saying, yes. when you're raising these taxes, you're charging these other taxes as you import your car, it is based on a customs value that has been assigned. So when you come to tax the motor vehicle, why would you charge a tax on a value that is inclusive of taxes? Uh, first of all, as I've said, this particular tax is trying to introduce an element of the comfort of your insurer. That is why insurance is being factored in in this particular case, so that the value of that car as at the comfort of the taxpayer mm -hmm. or at the comfort of the insured and the insurer is that what, what is the component? Because the minimum way, because if you introduce other parameters, you will create another element of confusion in arriving at it. So, convenience first. Sam. Yes, uh, Sam. Uh, yes and then Dr. Kiro. Yeah, uh -huh. Sam, that's one of the gray areas of this. Because what this bill is proposing is to give the powers to the commissioner mm. to determine uh, by prescribing uh, how valuation is to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, it talks about the value will be based on make, model, engine capacity, and all that. Right. And uh, you see, as you put it, a lot, the value of the car, in fact, if you are buying a car today, almost 50% of it is Thanks. duty. Yep. So that will also be built onto what you are supposed to pay as, as, as motor vehicle tax. So it's, to me, it's not well thought out. This, this, this tax, to me, it is something that should just be taken off this bill. I, I have no any other words to, I, I don't even want to save it. <laughs> Dr. Kiru. Yes. 
I think I have a problem with this government. I think you are letting Kenyans down very badly and we're very disappointed. When you start telling me Germany has done this, Germany has done that, and, and Netherlands and US and all that, it reminds me of a story of, 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 of this poor man who went to Benjamin in a rich man's house and he saw all the food is brought to the table and everybody does self-service and he thought it was very nice. And so he went home and he said, self-service. And the first two kids served everything and there was nothing left for anyone else. So the question is, have we ran out of models of countries which are comparable to us, who are doing better and in the same context with us? If you tell me about Germany and Ecotac, they've got all these other alternatives of green, green alternatives. They've got electric cars, they've got good working public transportation. I, don't even, I went to school in Germany myself for my PhD and I didn't, there was no need of using public t transportation. Use the time reading a newspaper, it's fast, it's efficient, it comes on time. I mean, if you tell me, me, poor Kenya, and I went to Germany and I benchmarked this, I'm looking at you like, surely, are you, are you in sync with what I'm going through? So please, government, you can do better in terms of this benchmarking that you're doing. I know you get a lot of money going to Germany and wherever, but please look for countries who are like us and who are doing good and tell us, Ethiopia is doing this, Malawi is doing this, uh, Tanzania is doing this, and they are, you know, let us learn from people who we are selling in the same boat. That is why you are telling us about diapers and you're not telling us what to use. Do we carry babies without? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Do better. You know, Dr. Kiru, did you just say that uh, they get more money going to Germany? <laughs> yeah, I... per diems. I think some I would wish, you know, without um, undermining my sister, yep. but I wish to invite her. Especially, mm. I know she's a person of the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at a level she reads. I really wish to invite you to also participate in the discussion around environmental in impact and uh, climate change mitigation, where Kenya has been singing about managing this carbon rating, carbon uh, emissions. This is something that is not purely a revenue measure as a state. And it's not a unique thing to us here. Maybe as to how it is now coming at the first time, we are now discussing the effects on it. And as I agree with but this is an area that we need to discuss around it, isn't it? But in the long run, already we are partisan. We are member to these particular treaties. And it's in practice elsewhere. So it's not a question of benchmarking. It's not a question of a new thing we are introducing, but it's a question that we are living to the fact you know, that environmental think... issues that is being discussed globally. Yeah. And even the president is on record has been participating in discussion. Honorable Kipler, I, think I yes. hear you, yes. but remember that um, the Republic and its institutions are supposed to be serving the people. Even if there are global issues that are coming up, they have also to be alive to the contextual realities that you deal with here. And I've just told you, the fuel you pay in your car, if you use petrol, from a price of 192, the taxation is 76% of the landed cost. The effective rate, then it's almost 50% of what you're paying at the pump, are taxes. And these are being paid by people who are running those motor vehicles. <coughs> so there's an element that feels there's almost a double taxation on the face of just running that car, but also that's the issue that we are talking about, the value itself. So fine, um, maybe some key took us have said because we are yet to go through the public participation. Let's also factor in the discussion around this area. Okay. But as I did in the long run, we are living with the fact that they are treat this, there is a direction that the whole global is going as far as matters uh, environment issues are concerned. The only issue is, as I agree, are we prepared for this? Okay. Yes. No, what all right. mechanism I'm, are we putting in place? I, I, I hope this counts for public participation also. It is, it's um, of course, you will be there. I, I know <laughs> you will be there. I, I, Irene, yeah. what do you, what's your take about this issue of motor vehicle? Because um, quite controversial, but when you interrogate the details, then a lot of uh, things are not clear, including that valuation by the, commi by the commissioner. Uh, on the motor vehicle tax, uh, I think that, that that tax should just be removed as presently is uh, uh, designed. As we've said, it, we don't see the policy orientation around it. Is it environment? We've said it doesn't align with any environmental best practice. If it's revenue, we've said within our system, there is no alternative. How do our public transports look like? So uh, I'm, I'm assuming when we were having that discussion, I, I, uh, my prayer and hope was that that is a top level public participation that Moshimiwa has gone with and that will be abolished even without people making submissions. Because I think Moshimiwa 
what we owe it to our citizens, not even, as we've said, president has made public declarations, we have signed treaties, but what is our lived reality? So I think that would be the, the, the basic principle. How would this affect citizens? Best practice in some of those countries is zero, zero corruption. We haven't adopted that best practice. So my, my take is that the best practice on good governance it should be the same. The government can, should not tell us uh, that this is the best practice. Let's apply those best practice first in our governance. Uh, uh, the second aspect, I think, which I wanted to speak generally around all these provisions we are speaking about, I feel that citizens ha have been left with picking uh, clauses and saying this clause is good, this clause is bad. But I think the Treasury and the executive must do better. They bring a document that is fully defective. If we are to look at most of those provisions, are provisions that uh, just don't align to, to the situation currently of a lot of Kenyans. So my, it, it would be really good for us to see uh, the finance committee rejecting some of this document, even without and saying, go and this, we cannot even subject this to public participation. Because as the document is, even if we say we are going to go for public participation on what, what are the options? Eventually, if we were to have a document, it's a document that will not serve Kenyans. Mm -hmm. So I think at the point of formulating a, a bill, Whoever is formulating it should not formulate it and give parliament and the committee a hard time because uh, Mwishimiwa, these bills will continue giving you more submissions than last year. And I can imagine the number of times uh, time spent on looking at that. So this for me, again, shouldn't be narrowed down so much to parliament and the committee. We also need to ask ourselves, who are the creators of this bill? What are they thinking? Mm. Are they not looking at our own social economic realities as a country? So that is one, because even if we go for public participation, my concern is on what? Even if we are had on what? They will pick clauses, but we will still get 80% of a defective document. So my take is that at the point of formulation of these bills, let Treasury align, because something like uh, uh, the, the motor vehicle uh, 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 tax should not even find its place here. And so even parliament should be asking, why would you waste our parliamentary time? Because that is waste of parliamentary time. If already uh, the committee member is, uh, is saying, uh, is almost going by our side and saying this one will not be discussed, <laughs> then the question should be asked the people who are bringing this document, <coughs> a document that will not take 80% on a back and forth with Kenyans. But uh, Sam, if you allow me. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some, if, if we continue as a country with this protracted and emotional discussion around the finance bill, we miss very good provisions, either environmental. So we need to ask ourselves, why are Kenyans so averse to issues around tax? And the thing is, still brings us back to, to accountability. If mm. Kenyans felt that that money, we wouldn't, I wouldn't take a whole week reviewing this because I'm trying to look at the detail. Why is government trying to steal my money? I have no trust in the government. Mm. So it's, uh, the question is we need to build trust and accountability. Not, not most countries use as much time as we are using on the finance bill. And the question is be, everyone is suspicious of the government, private sector, civil society, citizens. It's because we look at our audit reports. We look at uh, what it says. I don't know what the pack chair looks like every, looks at, looks at every other day. So if we address the accountability, we'll, we'll, we'll reduce this acrimonious process right. that in it we have <clears throat> lost very progressive. Some for now you can see if we go this way, we'll, we'll lose out on the minimum tax. A very good provision on base duration and, and profit shifting as Moshimi has said. There are good provisions even within the eco levy if we pick some of the bad that are very progressive but no one has trust. So I feel we are going back as a country and it's because of the governance and trust deficit that we have in our government. And, uh, Just a question, Honorable Kipler saying, so will you at the committee, um, how does it work? Do you depend on what the public tell you or stakeholders tell you, or are you also able yourselves as members of the committee to consider a close by close and say this, this should be the position based on your uh, First of all, Sam Kituku, yeah. you need to appreciate that parliament has a duty to make law. Yeah. A treasury or executive submit their proposals. Mm -hmm. It's not once or twice that even a committee or a parliament has rejected some proposals. Even the previous tax uh, tax policy that treasury submitted at the committee level, we rejected because when it looked at it, it was inconsistent. It was not a thought out mm -hmm. policy. So we rejected and asked them to resubmit. Our but but on this one, because so on this particular issue, I'm trying to put to, sub, to, to to justify the fact that it is not a final what the treasury are proposing. When we listen, like now, this guy already I'm picking something as a committee mm. member from this discussion. Mm. We will also be picking a lot when uh, sectors submit. No, what, what I'm asking is, Moshmua, um, yes, um, because <laughs> this show will end. Yes, 
but there are people who write memoranda to you. Yes. There are people who come to you in the public hearings. Yes. There are things they'll not touch on. Yes. Does it end there, or is the committee also able to, based on their own, the members' experiences and interaction with the document, to make amendments that they think of should course, be? Of course, of course, we are going to. There are a lot of amendments we are going to make as a committee. A lot of them. Regardless of whether you receive submissions of or not. Of course, whatever in our wisdom, in our evaluation, in our research, because you remember also, we have a team of research from parliament, mm. like, uh, experts yep. who assist us. Look at this. They're already looking at this particular, especially the budget uh, uh, office mm -hmm. in, the, in the parliament. They have already looked at critically, and they're the one who have already given us an indicative areas that we need to look at that probably are not going to work. You see, we cannot make a law that is not going to work. All right. Like now, issue uh, here that raised by Dr. Mm. We'll have to look at critically how is this going to be implemented. You, you, you get me? So we must look at everything that because as uh, we cannot make a law that it end up being thrown into the trash All right. that is going to be completely. I, I so, Let, let's take a look at some feedback that has come to us at Citizen TV Kenya. Sam Gichuku, the hashtag to use is Citizen Daybreak on what Kenyans are saying this morning. Honorable Lillian Sioi, I think this is your colleague in the house, uh, is saying that we must all understand that the current tax measures are temp temporary options um, that are employed to resuscitate and stabilize our economy. Once we are on a steady path, all we will be doing is enjoying life going forward. Mm. Is, is that accurate? These are temporary measures that once we, we okay, <coughs> I don't know, she's well, your colleague. The, 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 the SNS of annual finance bill, the SNS of having finance bill every year, first of all is trying to react to the performance of the previous financial year. Uh. Uh, and um, trying to meet the gap Look at this now. We are trying to focus on fiscal consolidation, which is an attitude. So this is not temporary? Uh, no, no, it's because, not, I mean, that is our views, but I'm trying to put, <laughs> I'm saying, the essence of every year having a new amendment or having a new proposal in a finance bill is trying to critically look at the behavior or performance of the previous budget in terms of financing, so when in you're terms of expenditure. Fiscal consolidation, in other words, you're saying to raise more revenue? And, uh, and minimize, and, and minimize the aspect of budget deficit. Oh, finance bill does, doesn't... Uh, of, look at any amendment in it is trying to raise the revenue and okay. minimize the dependence so, on, the, on, 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 the, on the budget deficit, okay. which has been a problem for quite some time. I'll give an opportunity. That we've come through, Honorable. remember this, yeah. we've come through a regime that we've faced a lot of difficulty in terms of foreign exchange that has given us a lot of foreign expenditure that has increased our debt, which we have now been struggling to pay interest, not even uh, terminating the principal. So these are issues so that, that so if you look at critically on this one, bill. yes, if you look at this. Okay, I want to take a look at uh, some more feedback, then I'll hear reactions from the panel. Babu Michael, I have concerns on the bill grants KRA certain exemptions to data protection laws for tax assessment and collection purpose, uh, purposes. KRA will have power to refrain from recovering unpaid tax under certain conditions. Why and how? I don't know if Irene, really have any reaction to that, especially in the question of uh, data protection laws? Uh, yes, on uh, the data protection laws, I think pr the aspects of privacy is uh, a right that is uh, jealously guarded by the Constitution and uh, all other jurisdictions. So that's an area we have to then look at uh, what is a taxman's uh, jurisdiction that doesn't pry too much into privacy. But again, we have to look at the, the uh, technology uh, aspects and how people are now hiding and creating property. So I think, again, these are two competing rights that will be guided, again, by uh, the legal uh, offices. Mm -hmm. The Office of the Attorney General should be able to weigh in and advise government. But I would feel that it shouldn't be. All rights, of course, are limited mm. by the general good. <clears throat> so if your right to privacy allows you and we've seen court giving orders. You can then go and uh, someone freeze someone's account, access someone's bank statements. So we need to look critically at that. Right now, I wouldn't have an answer. I haven't looked at it as critically. Okay. But my immediate is that uh, these are two competing rights. Mm. And we know that uh, it will get uh, crazier in terms of how people hide and create property because of technology. So the traditional ways of reporting and voluntary mm -hmm. uh, compliance might not work. So how do we balance these two competing? But of course, the right to privacy is, uh, and confidentiality is one of those jealously uh, guarded rights. OK. Um, is it possible that finance bill can actually amend data protection law? Yeah, it can give 
I mean, you can give um, powers to the commissioner. Yeah. Actually, they don't talk of KRA. They largely talk of the commissioner. Right. Uh, to get access to mm -hmm. some information uh, that ordinarily would be protected by the other law. Now, the, the way... Um, now, the, the way it works is that if there is a conflict, then the law that was enacted last takes precedence. Mm. And that is where now the, the problem, the lawyer here can tell us more. But my knowledge and mm -hmm. understanding of legislation is that if there are two pieces of legislation or statutes that uh, contradict each other, uh, uh, unless expressly stated, like PFM Act, that on matters, finances, it takes precedent, then you realize that uh, now this one may <coughs> ordinarily, quote unquote, repeal the other one. Mm. Uh, but I think we need, when it comes to areas like limiting rights, it is something that must be explicitly stated that now we are limiting this right because of this good to the public. So those are things that we need to do. If this uh, finance bill is going to limit, limit some rights that I enjoy, mm -hmm. then it should be explicit expressly and explicitly stated in the act and the reasons given mm. so that we are clear why we are um, limiting those rights. But I agree that rights can be limited. Okay. However, uh, Sam, if you allow me, there's a, uh, my colleague in parliament talked about this is a temporary measure. You know, let us be very careful, especially if you are people's representatives. This same, same language has been spoken from 2013 that we are doing this temporarily just to get out of problems. Right now, you may be lied to that we are getting out of huge budget deficit. It is on paper. But when it comes to actual budget implementation, we still end up increasing the debt uptake way beyond what we had approved in our budget estimates. It happens. Look at the budget stock, the stock of, of debt. It keeps on piling. Mm. And worst of all, it is now domestic debt that is piling at a very high rate. Yes. And we all know that domestic debt attracts higher rates of interest, 18%. 20, in fact, effective rate is even 22% because we are not taxing, uh, especially the infrastructure bonds. So we, are not, we should not be lying to Kenyans that we are getting out of the hole. How do we get out of the hole when part of the stories that we read is has budget too? <laughs> And we are telling Kenya, we are reducing uh, the budgetary allocation for responding to disasters, like it happened in my constituency on mm. 29th mm. of last month. We lost four people out of the flash floods. People, uh, shambas have been swept away. You are reducing budgetary allocation to that. We don't know how the weather will behave uh, in, in the next uh, year. Yet, you are hiring helicopter to carry the president and other joy riders. In fact, if you look at the team that is <coughs> in the US, you ask yourself, what are they going to do there? A huge delegation to the US. To do what? To talk to Biden? We don't need, the, you know, these kind of wastages, and it happens. Some, let me just as a wind up. The Auditor General has brought a report before my committee on Article 223, mm -hmm. how it has been abused over the years. I have attempted to propose a legislation to limit and control how that article is used. Do you know the end result? I was before his committee, finance committee, and they were largely in agreement with me. The Treasury came after me and trashed everything. That legislation has been rejected at the point of pre-publication. It cannot even see the light of going to the National Assembly. Parliament being controlled by executive Should. because Treasury is the biggest culprit. In fact, it's like you are bringing a criminal. Does Treasury have to agree with it for his? For it that is the question you want to ask. You are bringing a criminal to determine or decide whether he should be convicted or not. Treasury is the one that is misusing. Look, right now, you, you read the other day how Article 223 is being even used to give money to the office of the DP. To do what? Article 223 should respond to emergencies and cases where we did, like the, the floods that we had in the, across the country. If we didn't have enough money, then we should use Article 223 to allocate more money and ask for parliamentary approval. Some, I would tell you, as a country, we are not serious. And these excuses, 
that my colleagues are giving. I started speaking about Eurobond in 2013. Go to the records of parliament. No one listened. Now they have taken a more expensive Eurobond to retire. <coughs> expensive Euro and then you are being told we are getting out of the debt uh, quagmire. We are not. As a country, the next president will speak the same pre language that Ruto is speaking. Dr. Joy, you're coming to the end of the show, but what is your takeaway? Because the president said last week that um, by the time he's done, he wants the taxation at 22% of the GDP, meaning uh, because we are not expanding the economy as much as, as fast as we would want to grow the taxes. What is the implication of this and what do you think leaders need to be conscious about? You see, if you look at taxation, the biggest mistake that you're making in this country is that we are looking at taxation as a way of raising government revenue per se. We are looking at the end goal as more money to government. For what? To fly? This morning I heard that there's no money for vaccines. Vaccines are running out. School feeding program has been scrapped off. Then all of a sudden we're seeing us like jets. I mean, we are of $200 million. Uh, we are seeing status of fabrication. Now, if you look at it as collecting money without looking at really what economically, what are the taxes supposed to do? They're supposed to maintain macroeconomic stability, resilient livelihoods, stimulate economies and growth while bringing in revenue. So the end goal is this all other people's livelihoods and well-being, not the revenue collection. And if you just focus on people's livelihoods and well-being, you will, you will do right policies, or rather just policies when it comes to taxes. But if you look at it as just money for the sake of having money for spending, and spending on what, that's where the mistake really comes in. We should look at, we should have the correct perspectives on what really taxes are supposed to do okay. and focus on that and let the revenue generation be the secondary measure or, 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 or rather the secondary outcome of taxes, okay. not the principle. Uh, Irene, your closing remarks because again, um, every year the budget and appropriations, um, what, is, what, is the, what is the word? The budget statement, the every other year it, it's growing, the expenditure is growing and therefore necessitating even more the, the revenues that need to be raised. So when do we stop? Um, but also, what are the alternatives? Okay, uh, one, uh, just piggybacking on what my colleague has mentioned is that uh, uh, as a country, we need to look at the aspects of tax and redistribution. So we progressively we are seeing government asking for more taxes, but they are, uh, seeding their role. So a lot of them, they're going towards public-private partnerships. So what is the essence of adding more uh, taxes to a government? But they tell you that for a road, you have to pay. For healthcare, there's another fund. So we need to ask our question, ask ourselves a question, where is the resource going to? And when we are looking at public-private partnerships, what of the uh, uh, people in the, in, in the villages? Secondly, I think I would want to, uh, as, as we close, to see, just see a government that can push back. So a committee that would first ask itself, when revenue uh, bills and finance bills are brought before us, are we having conversations with our PAC uh, counterpart? Because the first question would be, you want more taxes. What happened within the last report? So I would want that to also maybe preoccupy the committee more, that the first order of business would be to ask the PAC uh, counterpart, have the audit reports become better? So it's only on that basis that you, you can then say you are approving. So if the audits are wrong, don't even look at that document. I think there's an incentive that government must demonstrate what have we reduced. And secondly, when we talk about fiscal consolidation, <coughs> we would want to see it also from the government side. So a lot of fiscal consolidation goes towards essential public services. How do we reduce that? But we don't see a serious reduction in the excesses of the executive, of both public and state officers. So if we're able to look at those three, I think we can be able to have uh, the, the, the budget reducing, because as we are saying, the finance dis discussion is also a budget discussion, as uh, Honorable Ruto said. If you want and you bring so many needs, then the finance bill will, of course, be more. So okay. that, that for me is that we are all watching as citizens. And I think we, as leaders, you owe us that to stand with the citizens within these hard economic times. I wanted to have the final word. Um, 
let me take what you had said to be the last, uh, but for you, your final word and, and your takeaway, even as you go to do that very important. Even a minute. Actually, <laughs> 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 did. Thank you so much, Sam Kituko and my colleagues. First of all, we have had a, uh, <clears throat> a very nice uh, discussion and engagement. I want to agree with my colleagues. The issues of corruption is a serious embedment in our economic growth. And I think this is something that as Kenyans now, we need to call ourselves into meetings. Those in the offices, those are the agencies, even back to our household, I mean our family level, that the aspect of selfishness, where you want to have everything by your soul, by all means, is now costing us. We have all this discussion around here. Kenya Revenue Authority need to have also their game because now we are discussing the shortfall in our collection. And if you look at a lot of filtrages and uh, le leakages I I in their system, it's also another problem. Um, devolution is a big issue now that is in, our, in, our, in the head of our, our minds. Where control of budget every given time releases a report, good reports on absorption of development in devolution. But go down there, you will hardly see exactly where is this money invested. And I think it's one of the offices that um, Bad will agree with me that we need even to resource much mm -hmm. so that they have m enough muscles to follow the money, they open the gate to where they are going. If devolution will have their game, especially on the health sector, transport sector, we reduce the dependence on the central government. That will be one mechanism of reducing our tax, uh, ta uh, tax expend, I mean our budget expenditure. If we reduce our budget expenditure, mm -hmm. we will be able to reduce also on the uh, discussion on the finance bill. Lastly, uh, next discussion probably, if we're able to have uh, discussed the budget structure, right. the behavior. Right. So that we also stop discussing of budget corruption. We want to see keenly. Let us look at the recurrent. When we say recurrent is around 1.2.3 trillion or four, say like that. Mm. The development is around 600 billion. We have 400 billion going to devolution. Some, all this together, we are still going back to okay. de deficit financing. There is issues to do with uh, bending bills. You know, we need to have time and look at all this because that's another element again yes. that we need to address. If we address the bending bills, we are going to stimulate money in circulation and the economy right. will build up. Okay, okay. All right. Very pertinent issues that you raised. Sam, I promise I'll not take more than one minute. 30 seconds, yeah, please. 30 the, seconds. The next session I'll, I'll is in I'll say we yeah. need to take public participation seriously. Yeah. First, it is not just parliament which is supposed to do public participation. The executive needs to do public participation. If you're making tax proposal, please let Kenyans know. Finally, I want to also repeat that even us in parliament, we let Kenyans down. All these provisions you see in the finance bill were with us here in February. BPS had already spelled out what was supposed to be done to raise funds, including the motor vehicle, and we passed it. Uh, so I think these are things that we need uh, so that we don't <coughs> waste time, as she mm -hmm. put it. Okay. Uh, sorry, we're out of time, Honorable Kipleting. We, we'll, have, we'll have you <laughs> next time. Um, <laughs> but tonight also, Yvonne Okwara will be speaking to the chairperson of uh, Budget and Appropriations Committee, Dean Dinero, about some of those provisions. Uh, so be sure to catch that. And very important uh, questions are being raised here. That's our time here on uh, the questions about Finance Bill 2024. We hope you've benefited from something. Uh, Julius Kipleting from Kesses, Dr. Joy Kiru from the University of Nairobi, Mushmo John Badi, um, as well as Irene Otieno from the National Taxpayers Association. Thank you for making time for us of this conversation. Up next is Matters, our show with Safin Aching Omar.